So welcome everyone to the Living Longer Better monthly seminar series. My name is Rob Salguero Gomez and I am a faculty member at the Department of Zoology at Oxford. Together with my colleague Hannah, we are co-organizing this online series where we ask researchers across the University of Oxford and also beyond about how the research influences the ways in which we understand how we can get to live longer and better. Along those lines, before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to highlight the fact that we have got a fantastic online platform called ARCH at Oxford. ARCH is the Aging Research Collaborative Hub that um, can be thought of as an entry point for all of the exciting aging related research that takes place across the four different divisions at the University of Oxford. So if you're interested in knowing what Oxford is currently working on senescence or aging wise, do please spend some time to take a look at that wonderful website. I'm going to overview a few of the rules of engagement, which are quite minimal, but still. I'd like to ask the attendants to please, to please mute yourself and uh, feel free to switch off your camera if you would like to, so that the broadband can really focus on today's speaker, Professor, um, Professor Sarah, Sarah Harper. Um, I would also like to encourage the attendants to post your questions in the chat channel, which can be found at the bottom in the little chat design icon. This is going to be a recorded uh, presentation with the main point being that after the presentation is done, we will make it available to folks who perhaps due to different time zones or other time commitments might not be able to have attended. So feel, um, be, be aware of, of that fact, please. I'll make a brief introduction by the speaker today, and then I'll hand it over to Professor Sarah Harper in a second, who will be, be taking us through some of the exciting research that she, she's conducting. At the end of the one hour slot, uh, you will be given an opportunity to ask the questions, which I'll be moderating. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Sarah Harper, who today will be talking about how to achieve a healthy life expectancy for all. Now, Sarah is a very dynamic researcher who has got a long proven record of academic excellence. I'm gonna to attempt to do justice to that excellence in a brief introduction, but by, all, by no means will that be uh, extensive in the interest of time. Sarah is a Chlor Professor for Gerontology at Oxford. She's also a fellow at the University College and the founding director of the Oxford Institute of Population Aging. She currently directs the Oxford Program for Fertility, Education and Environment, Oxfair. And she's also a co-PI in the DAI, the Design of Art of Aging, Design of Aging Institute, right? Yep. Thank you for that, uh, at, at the Oxford branch. She was appointed a commander of the order of the British Empire for her many and very insightful services in demography. Sarah served as the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology, which advises the UK Prime Minister on the scientific evidence for strategic policies and frameworks. She has also served as the director of the Royal Institute of Great Britain and is currently the director of the UK Research Integrity Office and a member of the Board of Health Data Research UK. Among many uh, awards and recognitions, Sarah is a fellow of the Royal Anthropology Institute and holds a Royal Society for Public Health Arts and Health Research Awards for her very extensive and hugely impactful research. Sarah, we usually say that it's an honor to have the speaker, but uh, it really is an honor to have you today with us. So thank you so much for partaking in these monthly online conversations. And we're all looking forward to hearing and to learning from you. I will hand it over to you. I will now share my screen and then ask you to please share yours. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. And Rob, thank you for um, your introduction and for hosting this um, excellent uh, series. Um, we have actually learned a huge amount since Rob arrived in the university because he's uh, integrated us in with many um, biologists who are working on aging. So it's it, it's been wonderful to be linked into that group and, and to watch it uh, grow. So I'm now going to turn my video off and then I will share my screen um, and uh, start the presentation.
Okay, so I'm going to be talking about, um, I say achieving healthy life expectancy for all. And, and in a way, it's a rhetorical question. Um, and the really important things are twofold. Um, this seminar is actually on health, but many people who work uh, in the demography of aging are really interested in life expectancy uh, and tend to forget that actually from a societal point of view, it's healthy life expectancy that we should be uh, aiming for. Uh, and the other really key uh, thing to look at is the words for us all, because as I will talk, um, it's very, very clear that it isn't just life expectancy, it's also healthy life expectancy that is riddled with inequalities at the moment. So we at the Institute of Population Aging are predominantly demographers and social scientists, uh, and we look at big sort of macro trends uh, and then work um, both with quantitative survey data uh, and with more qualitative data to try and understand not only the drivers of things like life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, uh, but also uh, the implications. So, hang on. I'm going to um, really sort of try and discuss three questions today. Um, will increases in life expectancy continue? Will advances in life expectancy be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? And really importantly for our societies, even with advances in healthy life expectancy, will increases in the sheer numbers of older adults in our population increase morbidity? So let's look at this first one and sort of deconstruct it a bit. Will increases in life expectancy continue? Um, in other words, will increases in life expectancy be accompanied by increases in life extension or are we seeing a compression of longevity after 100? Uh, and will life expectancy increase in line with the life extension and will we all enjoy the benefits of longevity or will we find it's only for a few? So let's look at this first one. Will there be an increase in average years lived by humans? There is a real difference between longevity and life expectancy. And I think uh, many of the biologists are particularly interested in things like longevity. How long can we uh, support human life in terms of increased years? Um, whereas life expectancy is much more around the increase in the average years lived by humans. Uh, and one way of, of thinking about that is that should we as a society be aiming um, to get the uh, individuals able to live 120, uh, 200, 250 years? Um, is that what we should be aiming for? That's life extension. Or should we all say, actually, we need to put resources into increasing the average years? In other words, let's get all the populations uh, up to 100 years of life at birth. Uh, and it should be that, uh, uh, looking at it from a population uh, a point of view and getting everybody to benefit from maybe a slightly less longevity, but life expectancy for everyone. So I'm just going to um, show you this. <clears throat> I think there's sometimes some confusion as to how we got here. How did we get here? Um, as everybody knows, um, we have had increases in life expectancy, that's the average age, uh, really for the last 250 years or so. Um, if you look at the uh, dark black line, um, that is the proportion of persons surviving successive ages uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and you can see very clearly that there was basically a lot of death uh, at the very early ages. Childhood was riddled with death. But then we had basically death across the life course. In fact, once you reached um, uh, adolescence almost, uh, then you could say that your chances of dying in a successive year, with the exception of women and reproduction, uh, was more or less consistent uh, across the life course. So much so that uh, in the uh, middle of the uh, uh, 19th century, uh, half the population of England, the, the, these are English data, um, were dead by about 45, 46. Um, and we have succeeded in pushing back death. This is called the rectangulization of the life curve. And now we have roughly half the English population will make it into their early 80s, if not uh, into their mid 80s. So how did we achieve that? Well, it wasn't actually modern medicine. It was very simple changes in things around um, sanitation, around public health, about improving nutrition. 
Um, and it really wasn't until the 20th century that we started to see what we think of as modern medicine coming in uh, and really pushing back uh, mass aging uh, for everybody. So we can look at this area. This is the 20th century. Uh, let's look at some more ONS data from uh, England and Wales and see what was happening. So this is um, UK male mortality, and we've just run it um, basically uh, across the 20th century. Um, and you can see very clearly the causes of death for men uh, at that time. Uh, and if we look at the uh, red is infections, the yellow is cancer, the green is respiratory and the blue is circulatory, we can see that generally across uh, the 20th century, uh, causes of death for men uh, decreased uh, across that. And we can learn some lessons from that. Let's first of all look at um, infections. And you can see there is an increase in death from infections, uh, which occurred um, at the uh, beginning of the century due to the First World War. And then a slight bleep you can see around about 1941, that time. Uh, and that again was from the Second World War. But basically, we have conquered death from infections for most people. And I know there is a big discussion uh, about the fact that we now have this antibacterial resistance and, and what is that going to do uh, to infections. Um, but I think the general view is that we will always be able actually to get on top of infections. However, it will be very much at a cost. Uh, and the era of cheap antibiotics uh, is probably uh, gone. Um, if I, before commenting on COVID, then look at the green one, you'll see uh, why there is some relevance because of course the green one is respiratory uh, and there is a massive peak um, in 1919, which was around uh, the Spanish flu outbreak uh, in this country uh, and the thousands and thousands of men uh, who died. I mean, obviously women did as well, but this is just uh, for men. Um, but again, we typically reduce respiratory all the way uh, down. Now, what will be very interesting, obviously, is to look at the figures in five years time and be able to look back to see what the impact of um, COVID uh, was. Uh, and without any doubt, we will see a peak um, of death probably recorded um, uh, in many cases around respiratory, maybe recorded around COVID itself, maybe recorded uh, around infections. So we are going to see a peak, but you can understand how things have changed so dramatically that we now obviously have a scientific community that is able to come in immediately uh, and conquer these kind of um, diseases. In fact, I don't know whether any of you heard this morning, um, Benke is leaving as the president of the Royal Society. He gave a very interesting talk uh, on the Today program this morning, um, comparing 20 years ago when we were faced with uh, the AIDS epidemic and, and how it took us so long even uh, to bring the scientific community together and how much we have moved on uh, over the last uh, 20 years uh, or so. So science obviously was coming in and was reducing uh, these deaths. Um, if you look at cancer, that's a very interesting one. Uh, you will actually see it's been flat across the 20th century and that's because probably to do with our lifestyle, uh, the aging world population and our um, um, environmental uh, changes. Cancer is actually, if you like, uh, incidence is increasing within our population, but we're stopping people from dying from cancers. The really important one uh, is circulatory, which is the blue one, and you can see this dramatic fall that occurred in male deaths around about the 1980s. And one of the reasons why I show you male mortality uh, is because it was particularly acute. Why did men suddenly stop basically dying from heart attacks and strokes in their 50s and 60s? And the general view is it was to do with a public health initiative all around uh, stopping smoking. So men had had a very high level of smoking and we had in fact uh, very good evidence coming out of Oxford in the 1960s which linked smoking not only to cancers but also uh, to stroke and cardiovascular disease. Big public health initiative uh, and uh, men uh, started to stop smoking and in all uh, uh, detailed figures from that time uh, we can see here uh, this tremendous change. So let's take that kind of thinking um, and say, well, has it happened elsewhere? And yes, of course it has. Uh, all countries, um, all countries in fact, um, one can say to a certain degree, particularly among the high income countries, have put 
reached back death across the life course. Um, and this uh, is showing, and we've here gone up to 2015, um, but we are showing here we have Japanese women, Spanish women, and French women, currently the longest lived individuals uh, uh, in um, the world. And you can see very clearly uh, that not only do we have um, far better life expectancy than UK women and US women, but also women consistently live longer than men. There's some very interesting biological research now coming out, uh, which suggests that even though women will change their lifestyles for uh, biological reasons, they, it is likely that we will always have longer uh, life expectancy, i.e. Uh, reduced mortality at all ages uh, because of these physiological differences, but that's obviously a talk uh, uh, for another time. What we really are interested in now isn't so much life expectancy at birth, but life expectancy uh, in old age. And so I've showed you here age 60, and you can see exactly the same pattern. Uh, the Japanese and these two countries, Japan and Spain in particular, are consistently way ahead uh, of uh, what is happening uh, in the UK and US. So we can learn something from just looking at these general uh, figures at the population level. For example, uh, as a, a British woman, I can uh, understand what may be why my life expectancy across my life and here at age 60 is so much lower than a Japanese woman. Um, I possibly have a slightly different genetic makeup. I definitely have had a very different diet and possibly a very different lifestyle uh, from women of the same age in Japan. But why should I have such a lower life expectancy, uh, particularly uh, than, let's say, French women? Uh, I think the answer lies um, if one actually delves down into that data and one understands that in actual fact, the line that separates France and the UK in terms of life expectancy is not the channel, it's actually halfway across France. And if you look at northern French women, they have roughly the same life expectancy as an English woman does. And it is something we believe uh, to do with the Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean lifestyle. Uh, and I think there is a, a lot of research now which is beginning to understand uh, not only uh, the impact uh, of uh, this kind of lifestyle, not just diet, but also maybe uh, sunshine, vitamin D, um, being um, far more socially connected uh, in some of those Mediterranean societies um, than we find in Northern Europe. And we'll look at that in a minute um, in slightly more detail. And then we can look at life expectancy uh, for men and women age 80, exactly the same kind of pattern, uh, very much dominated by these three top countries. Uh, look at the variance, however, year on year. Um, and I think that's an important thing uh, to recognize. Life expectancy when you get into these very old ages is not uh, a, a standard track. It does have huge variability in it. I just wanted to show you this because I think this is, is a very interesting slide. I recently gave, um, was involved with some work uh, with an Israeli group and went to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem at the end of last year. And as a consequence, we just thought we would look at um, uh, the life expectancy in Israel. And here we are comparing Northwest Europe and Israel. And to our actually astonishment, I have to say, we found that Israel was way up. Uh, here it is, um, way up here. Uh, in actual fact with French women, uh, and it is way, uh, in, in fact, above uh, other Northwest Europeans and men as well. And we were really surprised about this because in fact, many of these um, older adults, and in fact, I think if we go on here, we can see it at age 60, um, many of these older adults came from a European background, not from a Mediterranean background, which is where they're now living. Um, so many of them grew up uh, and moved uh, into the country later in life. And a lot of them came from Russia, from Eastern Europe. Um, and if we compare those life expectancies, uh, we can see they're so, so much lower than the Mediterranean type life expectancy. And yet here we have the is Israeli population who even though some of these women have only spent, uh, uh, and men have only spent a, a short period of time uh, living in a Mediterranean type society, they seem to have gained the benefits so that their life expectancy is uh, much higher than would be expected uh, given the background of many of those popul that population. So how long are we going to live? Um, this is female life expectancy at birth. It was a Lancet study uh, that caused quite a lot uh, of interest. Um, and if we just go back, sorry, it was published in the Lancet. Um, and the really interesting thing about this was that it was a probabilistic 
uh, analysis. It was slightly different, 2017, it was the first time this particular methodology had been used. But the interesting thing here is that you can see life expectancy at birth for South Korean women by this study uh, is now um, well over 90 years. Um, and here again, we have France, Japan, and Spain. Just South Korea is there in the background and, and is projected to come up uh, and overtake those countries within the next decade or so. And the really interesting thing about this study is that for many years, demographers had argued that we would never have a country where the life expectancy at birth for the population would be over 90. Somehow 90 was seen as that invisible barrier in a way that 120 is often seen as maximum life expectancies uh, barrier. Um, but we now have uh, projections from this data set uh, suggesting that no, we will start getting life expectancies among women uh, within 10 years that are into their 90s. And this must be a very familiar um, study to many of you. It's quite an old study now, but again, um, when it was published, it caused quite a stir. This is a completely uh, different data set. This is the human mortality database, very different um, modeling, but published also in the Lancet. And they looked at the oldest age at which at least 50% of a birth cohort would still be alive, um, taking the birth cohorts, cohorts from the first decade of the century. And you can see up here, we have Japan, um, 107. Uh, is the projection for those babies that were born in Japan uh, in 2007, in so much as 50% of that birth cohort is likely to be alive. It's 104 down here for France, Italy, and the US, and the UK is 103. So consistently, although we do have questioning about this, uh, we do seem to be thinking that at the population level, we will all be pushing back death and increasingly all having um, access to longer lives. As a consequence, there's been a huge amount of work now on centenarians. Um, and um, I'm just going to show you this piece of modeling that was done in the Institute by one of my colleagues, George Leeson. Um, and he, what he did was, was to uh, model the number of centenarians that are likely to be alive in the UK. Um, we have about roughly 14 to 15,000 uh, in about 2012. Um, he has projected that by the middle of the century, uh, if we look at the total line, which is the green line, we will have over half a million and we will have 1.4 million uh, by uh, the end of the century. Um, and he, after this was published, DWP and ONS did very similar modeling and came up with very similar figures. Um, similarly, uh, this is some work um, using the human mortality database doing similar kind of modeling for the US, 6 million uh, uh, centenarians in the US alone by 2080. Now, will these increases in life expectancy be accompanied by increases in life extension, or will we see a compression of longevity after 100? Uh, and that's the really interesting question. And I'm just going to refer you to a study by some colleagues of mine, Chen and Rabin. Um, they've done previous work, but this, this one from 2007, I think, shows it really very strikingly. Uh, this was from women in Japan. They've also replicated this uh, in France, uh, where we have enough of the oldest old to be able to really um, uh, make sense of the data at the population level. Um, if you look, this is the change in the distribution of ages at death, and you can see here it is peaking. This is in 2000 to 2004. But if we look at the line behind that, which is the 1980 line, you can see that as we have moved the top, so we are also moving life extension at the bottom. And I think increasingly uh, the debate is beginning to realize that as we push back, more and more people becoming centenarians, more people becoming what we call super centenarians. And so that's uh, people who live between 105 and 110 and more people really stretching out. Um, so yes, it does look as if life extension for some individuals uh, will uh, uh, go along with life increases in life expectancy. Now, I just wanted to bring this up um, because uh, this is much more familiar, I think, for people who work in zoology, and it's all about uh, genetic aging. But it's to say that, yes, social scientists are very much uh, taking this uh, on uh, board. Um, and this is uh, research, um, again, by a social science uh, demographer, uh, um, Rabin, uh, who's a French demographer, who um, uh, way back in 2003 was engaging uh, with this research um, and this idea that some of us simply age less fast than others. And I think since uh, this work and other work was published 10 years ago or so, um, we really understand much more the molecular biology behind this. And I'm sure you've had Lynn Cox talking to you 
about this. But if we look at it at a, from a social science or a demographic point of view, um, it's really important to understand that we may well have uh, a small proportion of our population uh, who are going to age less fast and therefore inevitably uh, live longer. Uh, and this study, for example, showed that um, when they compared those people who lived to 105 plus with those people who uh, had only lived into their um, 90s, um, the uh, oldest old group, uh, they had um, just significantly better biological and physiological risk factor profiles, less age-related disease. And that came up with this idea of the healthy aging phenotype, but it's very much now within the kind of research we do in demography. And I'm sure you all saw this nature debate on longevity, um, which again, many social scientists um, were very interested in. Uh, and, and this came out, um, Song and Al came out suggesting that there was a maximum lifespan of humans and that it was fixed at 115, which is a little ironic because we do have quite a few examples now of people who've lived over 115. Um, but the repost came back very strongly, including from demographers as well as from biologists, that our current understanding of the biology of aging points firmly away from the idea that the end of life is genetically programmed. So there is a lot um, of um, flexibility uh, uh, in both life expectancy and longevity. So this is the inequality argument. Will life expectancy increase in line with life extension? Will we all enjoy the benefits of longevity or is it just going to be for a few? Um, I think this is important uh, for this reason. Many of you will be aware that life expectancy at birth in the EU seemed to stall in 2015 and in actual fact uh, also seemed to slightly decline and we saw it in other high income uh, countries as well. And so there was a big debate at the time. Was it something to do in fact that there was a lot of flu around uh, in uh, the middle of the last decade? Was it something to do with uh, statistics? Was it something to do that when you are looking at such a reduced number of people as you have life expectancy getting well uh, into the late 80s that there is some kind of a statistical factor? Or was it actually something inherent in the population that was occurring? So two uh, key papers uh, came out uh, in 2017, one looking at England and one looking at the US, uh, asking whether in actual fact mortality uh, improvements had stalled uh, in these two countries. Um, we contributed to that debate through this. Um, and I think one of the things that both those papers pointed out, and as you will see in a minute, what our study pointed out, was that a lot of this was to do with inequality in our population. And this is really important. What we're saying is that in many high income countries, particularly the UK and the US, we now have such inequality in our population that even though we may continue to see increases in life expectancy among our higher socioeconomic groups, it is actually flattening and for women, in fact, falling in our low income groups. And that is happening to such an increased proportion of our population that it's coming out at the national level. So it was the inequality among the groups in our data that probably is pulling down uh, maximum uh, growth in life expectancy. And, and I just want to show you this study and how we contributed to it. So this was a study um, that we have been involved in and we've had access to two and a half million occupational pension records. Um, and I think what is really important is this word occupational pension because Unlike many other studies which take the whole population, or for example, we could look at Whitehall, uh, which takes uh, an entire group uh, of, uh, of the population. What this study was doing, it was only looking at those people who had occupational pension records. In other words, we had already taken away huge numbers uh, of adults, um, people who were involved in the gig economy, people who um, had had large periods of life unemployed and therefore didn't have an occupational pension. So we had taken a very much a better off segment. And even within this segment, we found huge inequality uh, in mortality. And I just want to show you this. Um, this is a comparison of UK life expectancies uh, to looking at men from age 65. Uh, and I, this is um, on this side, we have low and high groups. Uh, and this is our bottom 20% uh, and our top 20%. Uh, low income, ill health, retiree tended to be the factors of our low income, uh, low group. Uh, and high income tended to also to have normal health on retirement and have had a healthy lifestyle. But you can see that there was a 10.3 year difference 
uh, between our two groups in an already, as I say, uh, specifically sampled population. And if you uh, look at the um, way that this would span out uh, across the remaining life, this is the probability of reaching the next age. Uh, and we're comparing at the bottom our green unhealthy group, uh, our poorer, uh, lower educated group, and at the top our healthier group. Uh, and you can see that by eight, nearly 85, uh, your chance of reaching the next year, there was a 50% difference uh, in um, your chance of doing that. So this is something that carried across the life course. Uh, and even among, as I say, people who had occupational pensions, we see this difference. Um, we were able then to really try and understand what were these different factors on longevity. Um, and if you look at right at the top, the manual employee, a poor, unhealthy lifestyle, ill health retiree. This is our bottom 20%. If you're a member at age 65, they have on average 12 years. If this man had done a non-manual job, it only added in 0 0.4. We were very, um, we found that quite surprising, but that was what the data told us. High income, 2.6, but it was these bottom uh, categories. If this man had retired in normal health, 3.2 years would have been added on. And if it had a healthy lifestyle across the life course, uh, it would have been 4.1. So the vast majority uh, is to do with health across the life course. Um, and we really have to see life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, not as something that we just address at the end of lives, but that we look at across the life course. This was very interesting. We were, just to show you this particular work, where we looked at the regional effects on mortality. Um, and uh, if I just very quickly take you through that, um, over here on the uh, left-hand side that you're looking, we've got our 20 most affluent locations, and here we have our 20% most deprived locations. Before we were looking at the population, now we're looking at the locations uh, that these people came from. And what you can immediately uh, see is that when we're looking, this is again life expectancy at age 65, and so in our affluent locations, regardless of where these people were living in the country, you can see that there was very little variation across, with the exception slightly being Wales. Wales is a bit of an, uh, an outlier here. But if we look at our most deprived locations, you can see the considerable uh, variability. It really matters uh, if you're living in a deprived location where you are actually living. So one of the ideas, we, we, we've done a lot of teasing out of why this might be, why there might be this location effect. And what I think it is, is this. If you are a poor person and you're living in one of the more affluent locations, um, you are very much typically constrained by your local network. And because you are living in an affluent area, uh, we have uh, looked at anthropologists, talked to anthropologists about this and, and looked at things like peer effects, just simply that, that if you live in a community where, pe where there isn't a lot of unhealthy food on the high street, uh, and as a whole, most people in these populations uh, are living far more healthy uh, lifestyles, then because as a poorer person, you typically, your social network tends to be much more grounded in the local area, uh, you take on the benefits of living in that affluent location. Whereas here, if you are a rich person living in a deprived location, we know through things like your job, where your social network is, your education, you're highly likely to have networks that are outside the immediate location. You're not trapped in that deprived location and therefore you have uh, less influence of the poverty. You can escape. Well, Whereas if you are a low income person living in one of these deprived locations, it's far more difficult for you to escape from the local effect. This is really interesting because if we look at the research on mental well-being, we actually know that if you are a poor person uh, living in a more affluent location, that is bad for your mental well-being. But in terms of mortality, it does seem uh, that uh, if you are a poorer person living in a more affluent location, you will have a benefit from that. When we turn to life expectancy versus healthy life expectancy, uh, we see exactly the same. This is some uh, modeling that was done for the foresight review um, that the Institute was involved in. Um, and very simply, what that is saying is if you are a 65 year old man living in one of the more deprived areas, you will probably make it um, into your late 70s, but the whole of your 70s will not be in good health. Whereas if you are uh, living in, uh, if you're a 65 year old man living in our more affluent areas, 
then you will probably make it to your late 80s and you will not even go into ill health until you hit 80. So the whole of one's 70s uh, is very much the transition period uh, and it's very much dictated by typically uh, social uh, variables, uh, social deprivation, etc. So will these advances in life expectancy that we've been seeing be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? Uh, now, first of all, I have to say that the data is very problematic. Um, one of the when one's looking at it uh, at the national level, uh, whereas it's actually um, our life expectancy data is now very good. Our uh, healthy life expectancy data uh, is much, much weaker. Um, I just want to show you there are so many different ways in which we can model this. We, we have the DALIs from the Global Burden of Disease Programme. They're very similar to the GALIs, um, which also comes out of the WHO, but they're different. Uh, from the EU uh, measures, the disability-free uh, life expectancy. So disability-adjusted lives, disability-free life expectancy, uh, and the global activity limitation indicator. So slightly different uh, ways of recording. And I just want to show you this, uh, just to put it in some kind of a perspective. Here we have, um, this is a wonderful uh, study, uh, a real cross-comparative study. They were comparing different ages, different life, ex uh, different health uh, expectancies in all these different countries by men and women. And let's, if we just zoom up here, um, here we have, um, just look at men in Japan. Um, and you can see that over this period, different measures of uh, ill health uh, were shown. And if we blow that up, uh, you can see that even within one country, uh, it's extremely difficult uh, uh, over roughly the same time period, uh, very, very different uh, healthy life expectancy results came out uh, depending on the data. So the data is really problematic. And if there's one area where we need more research, it's really to have um, far better understanding of healthy life expectancy data. But let's very quickly um, go back to those uh, demographic uh, charts that I showed you. This is from WHO. Um, and uh, what is very interesting here is this is comparing, we're just looking at women aged 60, and here we're comparing life expectancy uh, with healthy life expectancy. And you can see consistently the gap uh, that uh, you have um, healthy life expectancy, which typically stops between six to eight years at uh, the population level before your life expectancy. Um, this is just to show you um, age 80, and we've just taken three countries here, uh, the life expectancy at the top here, France, Spain, and the UK, uh, and in actual fact, the UK is uh, slightly lower than the other two, and yet, uh, in actual fact, in terms of healthy life years, uh, we are doing better, uh, and our gap uh, between uh, health and life expectancy is actually slightly smaller, although you can see we have had a decline. What about going forward? Um, and I just want to um, uh, highlight this study, which came out in the Lancet um, last year, um, fantastic group um, who have been working on this. This is um, population, aging and care, and this is a forward-looking sort of scenario modeling. Um, and what they did was they took um, 2015 to 2035, um, and you can see uh, that in terms of and the measure we're talking about here is a compression of disability or an expansion of disability in our later lives. Uh, and we have men and women who are age 65. Uh, and they suggest that um, men will gain 4.6 uh, independent years uh, across that time in a life expectancy increase of 3.6. Uh, but women will only gain 2.1 years. Uh, and uh, they will actually um, have a life expectancy of 2.9. So we have an expansion of disability among women, although it's only mild disability, uh, which occurs from age 80, uh, whereas uh, men uh, have a contraction until uh, they um, reach uh, 85. So looking forward, not so good for women, um, but slightly better for men. So I want to sort of start drawing this to an end by looking at um, this particular factor, because there is a lot of debate uh, in the literature about the impact of obesity on life expectancy and healthy obesity. And there's been a, a, a long discussion uh, for uh, many years about whether increases in obesity in the population is going to have an impact on the healthy life expectancy of that population. Uh, this is um, from a colleague of mine in Chicago, New England Journal of Medicine, way back in 2005. He was predicting that obesity and its life-shortening complications 
uh, meant that life expectancy at both birth and older ages would level off or even decline uh, in the first half of this century. Um, what actually has happened? So uh, I'm very grateful, in fact, to Susan Jeb, who um, alerted me to these particular um, studies. Um, we know that a higher BMI is associated with various risk factors. Um, and here we have the risk factors for uh, vascular disease. Uh, and you can see very clearly uh, that uh, both blood pressure and blood cholesterol uh, tend to go up with uh, um, increased uh, BMI. Um, it's also associated with a, an increased risk of diabetes, um, exactly uh, the same association. And there is some argument that it is associated with reduced life expectancy. Um, this, however, uh, is quite um, contested. And I think we're beginning to understand um, much better the actual drivers uh, at the molecular level of obesity uh, and health, and therefore then extrapolate it into these a sort of more macro uh, life expectancy uh, data. And some argument seems to be that extreme life, ex extreme obesity, the higher levels of obesity uh, are actually reducing our life expectancy. But at the population level, uh, only moderate increases uh, in obesity don't uh, necessarily reduce your life expectancy, but they do reduce your healthy life expectancy. So thinking back to those graphs where we compared healthy life expectancy with uh, healthy life ex uh, expectancy, and we saw the health gap, uh, if anything, we should expect that to increase going forward uh, because obesity probably uh, uh, does reduce life expectancy, but only uh, at those uh, very large, um, higher obesity levels. But again, as I say, we, several studies are coming out with slightly different uh, conclusions. I love this study. Um, just because I think it shows it uh, very well. This um, was published in BMC Public Health uh, nearly 10 years ago. But what they did was they took a, um, a large sample of a Dutch population and they wanted to look at obesity, smoking and alcohol and whether it reduced life expectancy and uh, increased disabled years. And you can see very clearly from this that if we look at the bottom, uh, that in this particular sample, by the particular measures that they used, um, smoking uh, and alcohol uh, reduced life expectancy by both three to four years. Um, it also increased uh, disabled years, or in other words, reduced healthy life expectancy by three to four years. But obesity only seemed to reduce life expectancy by 1.4 years, but increased the disabled years at the end of one's life in particular by 5.9. So as I say, I, I think we really don't at the moment have enough data uh, to be able to tackle the life expectancy factor at the moment, it does seem that it's our healthy life expectancy that's being uh, affected. So I want to just conclude with this question. Um, even with advances in healthy life expectancy, will increases in the numbers of older adults increase morbidity within the population? And I'm just going to very quickly take you through um, some examples of this. And, and if you're interested, obviously, you, you, you can um, uh, browse these uh, later. Um, this. Uh, is the um, latest um, results uh, we have on dementia coming out of the CFAS study. Um, and the CFAS study, the dementia evidence, is actually, um, from a demographic point of view, uh, we see it as a, a very positive thing. Um, what they had done here was to look at the incident rates for dementia uh, in um, the uh, population. Um, and what they had shown very clearly, and you can see it uh, here, that um, the, um, there is a reduction uh, from the projection that they uh, thought was going to happen from the 1991. Uh, it was uh, reduced, uh, they suggest, by as much as 210 cases in the UK. Um, what is really interesting is that both age-specific incidents and age-specific pre prevalence in this population fell. And there was a lot of debate when this first came out. And I think the, the general view was that it could be just increased health in the population. It could be something to do with drug use within the population. It could be something to do with increased exercise in the population. But it also could be something to do with an increased education uh, in the population as a whole. And I just want to highlight this, which came out in JAMA uh, slightly after that. Um, this used um, 21,000 US adults from a health and retirement study 
Um, and they showed that among this population, dementia prevalence declined significantly from 11.6% in 2000 to 8.8% .8 in 2012. And they were able to show that actually this was because this particular group had left school one year later in so much as they happened to catch when they were children that time when uh, leaving school age went from 14 to 15. And the influence of one year schooling, they suggest, uh, actually followed them across their lives. And they believe that's why the age specific prevalence uh, came down in this particular um, study. And I'm sure you, you are all aware of this cognitive reserve hypothesis. Um, and um, I've had talks on dementia, but from our perspective as social sciences, this is where um, uh, the importance comes. Uh, however, coming back to my original question, um, which is what about just the sheer increase in the numbers of older adults? Um, and I think this is a very interesting uh, study. Um, this is the estimated numbers of people with dementia by age. Um, and this suggests that by 2040, there will be a big increase in numbers, even if incidence declines. And if you just look here at this dark blue just um, above the bottom, this is um, those people who are aged 70 uh, to 74 and younger. Uh, and you can see that there is a um, annual decline, they suggest 2.7 across the period uh, uh, in incidence. And yet in numbers, sheer numbers will just increase. So even though we may be able to reduce the uh, incidence of dementia, just because of the sheer numbers, we may well still have a big uh, health uh, burden uh, through to the numbers of people with dementia. Um, similarly, uh, this is a, another interesting study. And what they have done here is here we have the um, uh, cases. Uh, let, let's look on this side. Let's look on the uh, left hand side. This, so this is the prevalence of this particular uh, disability measure, which is unable to carry out one or more activities of daily living. And again, it's a projection which says that here we see for both um, women and men, uh, women are slightly higher uh, in all these studies, um, which goes back to that peak assimilation that we were talking about. But in terms of cases, we will have an increase purely due to the numbers of older adults we're going to have. And this, I think, is a very interesting study, which uh, goes back to that inequality argument. So crude incidence of heart failure could be reduced by 18% if the whole population had the incidence of the least deprived quintile. So here we have the least uh, deprived quintile, uh, and they show this isn't a, a projection going forward. This is uh, data from 2002 to 2014. They show how if everybody had this uh, incidents, uh, then we would simply at the population level reduce uh, heart failure. I'm going to flick through these just because of time. Um, and I just want to finish with these thoughts. Um, to date, the determinants of the shape of mortality and morbidity in the 21st century, as in the 20th century, have very much been framed by healthy living and disease prevention and cure. But we know that regenerative medicine and age retardation science is really beginning uh, to influence our understanding. And I think some people would argue uh, also, uh, in theory, the clinical practice around aging. Um, the key question going forward is how much life expectancy can we expect to, to gain with this intensive application of scientific medicine? Uh, and this, I am sure, is an area that, that many of you are familiar with, stem cell research, the new genetics, 3D printing, et cetera. But this is all now uh, very much uh, coming uh, uh, into um, the research and clinical trials even, uh, and going forward probably will have a huge impact. Um, and of course, I, I have to say that although I haven't really talked about COVID, but if one looks at the amazing understanding, particularly of the older adult immune system and immune systems in general, and the way that we might be able to conquer viruses, I think we will see uh, 2020 as some kind of a massive cusp in our understanding. And I think that will have huge implications uh, for both life expectancy uh, and healthy life expectancy. So I'm going to... Um, stop now uh, and I think we have um, maybe 10 minutes or so uh, for questions. I'm going to stop sharing and I will come back on board.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah, for a fascinating talk. I think it's been completely comprehensive of some of the key aspects that shape uh, not just lifespan, as you mentioned before, but also health span. Allow me to act as your moderator now. We have a couple of questions by uh, Christian Langkamp. Before I open the mic to Christian, I will like to ask the rest of the audience to please pose your questions in the chat channel, which can be found at the bottom if you click on the icon called chat. And then that will allow me to identify who you are and to give you the room to ask the question to Professor Sarah Harper. Christian, you're at first. If I, don't, you are I, don't, I don't need to repeat myself. It was more the, uh, on the regional, whether it's more the um, network and you know, kind of friends, whatever, or whether it's, uh, um, whether it's doctors, because in Germany, we have a lot of debate on rural areas not being serviced by doctors and hospitals. So I don't know how it is that is featuring in English. Yes, no, no, Christian, you, you are exactly on. So, so there are a variety of drivers. One without any doubt seems to be around social networks, but sadly, um, given that in theory, we have an NHS that is meant to provide um, quality health care from cradle to grave to every member of the population. Uh, we do know that um, in some of our more deprived areas for all sorts of reasons, maybe uh, particularly the primary health care um, struggles to provide that. And again, that goes right back into that argument, because if you are a wealthy person living in one of our most deprived areas, you can buy yourself out of that system. Um, you probably have access uh, to um, the private medical system, uh, although it's very, very small, that obviously would make a difference. Um, so I, I, I think you're right. It, it, it is things around um, social networks, peers, but it is also around, sadly, um, uh, access to um, healthcare. Very good. Thank you so much for that answer, Sarah. I encourage other members in the audience to also pose your questions. But uh, in the meantime, Sarah, if I may, I'd, I'd like to ask you a utopic question that might perhaps take a, a bit to answer, but if let's let's see if we can do this in a brief, relatively brief manner. So what's undeniable is that humans are going to be to live longer and longer. And that's coming with some really important consequences to the, the benefits, but also to the costs that that might bring to society. So what do you think a utopic British society would have to look like in say a hundred years? for the expansion of lifespan to, to be rightfully accommodated and to not provide any, any costs? Yeah, so, so I, mean, I think that's a really, really interesting um, question. And it is something that policymakers have been grappling with. And in fact, uh, way back, I think it was in 2003, the White House uh, had a symposium where it actually tackled that. And it said, if we are, this century going to be seeing life expectancies of over 150. Um, what exactly does that mean for our society? Um, to put it in perspective, of course, we have an aging population and the aging population isn't actually at the moment driven by falling mortality rates or increasing life expectancy. It's actually driven by falling fertility. So we are having fewer and fewer children and in many high income countries, many high income countries, we are not replacing our population by births. And the only reason our populations continue to grow and the classic example is the UK, because we haven't actually replaced our population, I think since 1976 by births alone, is because of immigration. In other words, we are balancing out our populations across the world. So that means that our populations will naturally become older. And I think Italy, by the middle of the century, will have half its population aged over 50. And by the middle of the second half of the population, I think most of Western Europe will have half its population aged between 50 and probably 100. So our societies are naturally going to change. And I think the really um, important thing is this um, access to all. And uh, I, I remember giving um, a talk at Side Business School, and uh, it was... Um, uh, an external meeting and on one side we had the Americans on the other side we had the Europeans and 
in the discussion, it was very clear that this particular group of Americans were talking about market opportunities. You know, how, how can we change the world so that we can take on board the market opportunities uh, that longevity medicine will bring to us? And the Europeans were talking about regulation. How can we ensure that this is regulated, that it doesn't get out of hand, and that everybody can take its benefits? Um, so I, it, it's complicated, but I think the important thing is that policymakers are aware of this and they are talking about this. I would say, unless things change dramatically, uh, we have quite a long time before we see life, expect life expectancies. In other words, um, the average uh, life expectancy, say uh, 50 uh, of high income populations being 120. I, you know, it, 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 I think we will get there, but it's, I don't know that it's going to happen this century. I mean, I, you know, it, it's, it, it, if we, I think it's more that those people that can afford this kind of medicine, uh, possibly particularly in the States, and I think those uh, countries where some of the ethical issues maybe will be swept aside in order that they can push forward scientifically, maybe China, that we will see individuals reaching these ages, but I don't think we're going to see mass populations immediately um, over this century. Thank you so much for that. Aha, we've got another question that just came through. Hiram, if you are able to turn on your camera, do feel free to um, ask the question yourself, please. Uh, sure, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful talk. I was just wondering from human uh, animal data, we know that there's a quite close link between the number of offspring you have and your life expectancy. So I was wondering if we see these in humans, which I know would be much more difficult to kind of compare yeah. because of all these correlates, but yeah. Um, yeah. So th that's really interesting. And there is a, um, a biologist called Tom Kirkwood, who in the 1990s actually wrote a book which talked about this. And what he had done was he had looked at historical data and he had suggested exactly that, that the trade-off for having children uh, and life expectancy was very similar to that which we see in the natural world. Um, I'm not an expert in this area and I have not followed up that literature. My understanding is it isn't, it isn't something that a lot of people have looked at, that there isn't a big debate out there about it, but I may be wrong, um, but definitely it, it was discussed in the 1990s. And, and if you look at Tom Kirkwood, uh, he did write several scientific papers about this using historical data. Thank you. Uh, we, we also have a question here about uh, Rob. Do you think this data on increasing life expectancy will mean an ongoing increase in global population? This came from Xin Yao. Oh, hi, yes, yeah, thanks, fantastic talk. I just wondered um, what you thought on that, but at the same time, it was somewhat answered by your comment about the reduction in fertility rates. Um, yeah. But I guess I, I'm also talking more about the trend as in we have an exponential rise in, mm -hmm. in global population at the moment and do you think that will continue? Yeah, so um, the reason why that's interesting is that there is some evidence at the moment that for the very first time increases in global population is driven as much by increases in life expectancy as it is by increases in childbearing and that's because in two-thirds of the world's countries women are at near or below um, replacement level in terms of the, the number of children they have it's only really in sub-saharan africa we still have these very very large numbers and so we know the world population is roughly seven and a half billion we are pretty sure it's going to go to about at least 10 billion it could go higher we don't know um, one of the reasons is that uh if you like, I mean, to put it quite tritely, we can say that demographically, people are no longer dying on time. Remember the rectangulization of the life curve? We're seeing that in, in these big global population pyramids, that whereas previously, uh, one might have a child uh, as a woman, and typically you would die before you became a grandmother. Uh, now in most parts of the world, and, and we can just look at women from this perspective, but and men, uh, but women in particular, the data uh, shows, um, may well become grandmothers or even great grandmothers. And, and it is the fact that these older generations are still alive at the same time as the, uh, the uh, babies are being born. We now know that is one of the drivers for global population. Um, but in, in a way, uh, I think it will um, uh, sort of level out because 
I don't think increases in life expectancy at the moment are going to be um, greater than the falls in childbearing that we're seeing. But, but this is a transition across this century, yes. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, that, that number of 10 billion, wh when is that estimated to hit? Yeah, so, well, the, the UN prediction was that the maximum world population would hit between 9.5 and probably 10 by 2050, and that it will, the argument now is, is it going to flatten and stay the same by the end of the century? And there is some suggestion that it may well increase depending what happens in sub-Saharan Africa, because here we still have total fertility rates or average number of children uh, per woman of reproductive age across their reproductive lifespan uh, of between four and nine. So there, there are very few sub-Saharan African countries where at the population level, they're back to replacement. So it's what happens in Africa is actually going to determine um, uh, our maximum world population. In the rest of the world, you know, throughout Asia and Latin America, particularly in urban areas, we're seeing dramatic falls in the childbearing rates. It's really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your question, Shinju. Okay, folks, so I think that in the interest of time, we shall bring the wonderful conversation to, to an end, not without first thanking Professor Sarah Harper for a wonderful presentation and also for her ability to address the questions from the audience in such a candid and, and really clear manner. Um, what I would like to do now, if I can remember how to do that, is to share the screen. Here you go. Um, I'd like to remind you all that this is an ongoing monthly seminar series. Uh, today, this month, we have had Professor Sarah Harper from the Institute for Population Aging at Oxford. But uh, we're now looking at speakers for the January events. We will not be hosting an event in, um, in December due to the Christmas break. So what I would like to do is to hear from you guys if you'd like to suggest somebody to present on exciting research on aging, or even if you'd like to volunteer yourself, do get in contact with me and we will organize that. The speaker will be announced through social media as well as internal email communications as soon as we have that pinned down. Sarah. Once again, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Cheers. Have a good day. Bye.